Increasingly, local authorities that own slipways and the small boat angling clubs that use them are asking members for proof of boat angling competency and insurance before allowing them to proceed. The time will eventually come when some sort of boat driving test is compulsory. The rest of Europe are currently putting pressure on the UK government to introduce a trailer MOT and sea angling permits are already being discussed. The most widely accepted minimum boat handling qualification is the Royal Yachting Association RYA Powerboat Level 2 Certificate. Yes, good morning. Um, my name is Peter White and I run my own school which is Sea Fever International and I spend uh, a lot of time working with Honda. Today we've come down for a two day course on RYA Level 2, Royal Yachting Association Level 2 and we'll be looking at a general overview of the syllabus. We will need to look at charts right the way through up to satellite navigation and uh, tides, the collision regulations and then on the practical side we need to look at general boat handling that comes in with launching and recovery and after the launch and recovery we'll do slow boat handling work. Some of that's going to take us to pontoons and jetties, picking up moorings and then of course the more very important area which is the man overboard drill, the man overboard recovery drill if someone's falling in the water and looking at a person coming away with a considerable amount of confidence to go forward but not to be overconfident so that they actually go out and make serious mistakes. So hopefully at the completion you'll be able to have a generally good idea of what you should be doing and how to do it. We've got everything on board that we need to have on board, yes? Yes. Charts? Charts. Radio? Radio. Navigation equipment? Nav navigation is, yeah. Yeah. Paddles? Paddles. Fuel? Fuel. Spare fuel? Spare fuel. What else do we need? Flares? Flares. First aid kit? First aid kit. Smashing. Right, in which case then, the boat's all ready, we've got everything off the boat, oh, sorry, everything off the trailer, we need to take off the trailer, and we're ready to go in the water. With over 30 years boat handling experience already in the bag, my initial thoughts regarding the course were that I would simply turn up, get on with it, and get the necessary documentation to continue with my fishing. In reality, nothing could have been further from the truth, but in the nicest possible way. It often takes something like this to reassuringly remind you of how much you do actually know, and equally that there are things you don't know or need to brush up on. The course itself runs over two days and takes up to three people. Hopefully, the next 12 minutes will offer some sort of flavour of what the training is all about. Launching considerations are quite important. Obviously you need to know what we're launching down. I mean, this slipway here is fantastic. It's concrete, it's in good condition, and it's got a quite a nice angle to it. But some of the launching sites we use, they're really suspect, where you might drop off the end of the uh, concrete straight into mud, and you might have to detach the vehicle from the trailer in order to keep the vehicle clear of the water. Lots of considerations like that. But if you actually look at the end of the slipway, we've got waves coming in on the end of the slipway and they're not going to cause us a problem. But they could be a problem if it was rougher and it certainly could be a problem if there's a large ship passing and it would create what? Because it doesn't need much of a wave to lift a boat off a trailer. And I find in life that more damage is probably done and more injury done to incorrect launch in recovery than when we're actually out on the water. Alright, I'd like to pull the kill cord off then to see if the kill cord works. Brilliant, so you've done those checks then. Right, put the kill cord back on and it should start first kick. Which is what's normal. Right, having started it, check you've got water coming out the engine. So check the telltale down your side, can you see it? Okay, right. So once you've fired it, check the telltale, make sure water's circulating. If it's blocked, it's usually blocked because there's a, something stuck up it. I usually keep a pin on board or a little bit of wire on board just to clear it if I have to. Um, and then if it's still not working and it doesn't work, then 
ready, you shouldn't be using the engine. recognise it when you come back. Quite important. You also have everybody in the boat in the position they should be in. So you know where they're sitting and that they're secure. I suppose this is the most important part of anything to do with boat handling. And the question to you guys is how's this boat going to sit in the water, in the wind, without the engine running or without the engine being in gear? I know we switched it off but um, David what do you think? probably going to lie with the wind um, pushing the boat up river uh, underneath this cut it probably bow first. The wind is coming from there, the sharp edges of the waves are coming at us and the soft edges of the waves are going the other way. The wind is coming at the moment over the starboard side of the boat. Can you actually see that? We're sitting broadside to the wind and most boats will sit broadside to the wind when they're dead in the wind. When we've got that engine running in tick over we're going to have the engine absolutely straight and we're going to go into reverse. Tell me please where you think the back of the boat is going to go before we try that exercise. Is it going to go straight back? Is it going to go down there? Or is it going to go up there? Don't. Depends on the rotation of the prop I suppose. That's right. which I'll way it's going to go. Nice one. I'll come on to that in seconds. Would you please, with that engine straight, just drop into reverse tickover? And now watch. happening? It's, it's going to starboard. It's going up into the wind. Mm. I think that's because of the tide pushing us as well. So we're going to actually go with the tide. Ah, but when we were in the tide, we were actually floating in the tide at the same speed as the tide, or nearly the same speed as the tide. Okay. Right, go to neutral, please. Spin the wheel right. Yeah, oh no, the other way. Sorry, my fault. Spin the wheel left. I'm sitting the wrong way. Just touch forward, tick over. Now neutral. That will bring the wind over my port side. Now straighten the engine. So the engine is absolutely straight. And we're now bringing the sharp edges of the waves over our port side. Tick over now, please, and watch the way the back goes back up into the wind. And this time it will go up into the wind faster than it did last time because we have the propeller walk walking the back of the boat in the direction that it wants to travel. So we've got the mechanical wanting to go that way, but also the back of the boat is going up into the wind. And you'll find with nearly every power boat, from that stage it will go up into the wind with the wind blowing down both sides of the hub. After a short session using the boat's the floating classroom, it was time to demonstrate our low speed manoeuvring skills including reversing around static objects such as moored boats and buoys. Okay, question time. Which bit of the boat's doing the turning? The engine's pushing the back of the road. The engine's pushing the back around. Where's the fulcrum? Where's your pivotal point? Because that is the correct answer. There's no other vehicle I can think of, although I'll probably get challenged on it, there's no other vehicle I can think of that has two totally different pivotal points. And that, of course, is one of the reasons why, when you're going astern, the back wants to go up into the wind. The pivotal point is close to the engine. You're doing a good job on this. Very good indeed. And on the far side, point to the casualty, please. I'll tell you where I'm the casualty. Slowing down and turning to starboard. At this point, I've been trying to sort out the wind direction, but I've got a real problem here with the wind direction. Don't take your eye off the casualty. Go to neutral now. Can you speak to Joe, please? Can you ask him if he's OK? And can you also tell him that we're picking him up on his port side? Can you shout at him, Dave, please? Yeah, are you OK, Joe? Yeah, he's OK. Distance, please, Dave? Distance, five metres. Keep it talking down. Yeah, distance, four metres. Distance three metres. That's what you need to do then is work him to the back of the boat to bring him up over the uh, boarding platform, yes, or the, or the ladder. 
Yeah. 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 Coming around the stern. It's coming on board now. The um, water that you can see out there doesn't necessarily mean we can use it. We don't know how deep it is. It looks wet, it is wet, but what's underneath is a problem. So the chart is really important to us. We have a chart, the chart will give us our position on the water, but it will also give us information and it'll show us depths of water and the water that we can use. So we've got the brown area which is land, the green area which is covered and uncovered as the tide rises and falls. And then after that you've got the contour lines 2 metres, then 5 metres and 10 metres. So we do need to know how much water we've got underneath us. With the chart also it will give us buoyage systems. It will show us where the marks are coming in from the open sea. We've got green on the right hand side which are cone shaped and then we've got red on the left hand side which are can shaped. And if you pan around you'll actually see them on the water. So this is giving us road signs it's showing us where we can go, where we can't, where necessary we can't go, but it is really, really important to us. Also on the chart is a latitude and longitude scale. The, the latitude scale goes down the side of the chart, it gives us that's our position. The longitude scale goes down the top and bottom of the chart, and that gives us our longitudinal position. So once we've got latitude and longitude, we can sort out our position. And that's bringing in, of course, satellite navigation, which is we call GPS, Global Positioning System, and that will give us our latitude and longitude. So from that we can find our location anywhere in the world, but we do need to have a chart with us to be able to fill that in. And we have a compass rose, which gives us north, south, east and west. Now on top of that compass rose, we have got magnetic north and true north. A true north is the north-south, and that runs parallel with the longitudinal lines, and then we've got a magnetic influence which changes around the country um, and the world and that will give us the position that the magnetic north will point in. The magnetic north will point through and the magnetic influence that we have. And then you've got the true north. So we need to know the differences. The chart therefore is vital. It's giving us our information that we desperately need. If we were to plot a direction and here I'm just using just the Portland course plotter. But if, for an example, I wanted to go from A to B, all I would need to do is know the latitude and longitude position of A and the latitude and longitude position of B. I draw a straight line between the two marks. I would turn the Portland plotter so the arrows are pointing along the true north and east and west. So we're using the grid system there to actually line ourselves up. If I then drew a line from A to B, my direction would be shown here in the course direction, 250 degrees, and of course that would be my true heading in that direction. The opposite would be 70 degrees going in the opposite direction, and therefore you would then have to add the magnetic influence to it. So there's really no excuse for anyone, and I really mean anyone, whether in a small boat or a large boat, to go out to sea and not know where they are. We have the technology, it's not expensive, not when you price that against a life, which is not expensive, and it means that you can enjoy your boating to total satisfaction, that you know where you are at any particular time. And you also can work out the tides and the depths of water, and you'll know exactly where you are in, on the world, in the world. David, well done. I hope you've enjoyed what you've been doing over the last couple of days. I'm very happy with um, to be in a position where I can award you the Level 2 certificate with a coastal endorsement. Book for you, sir. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Peter. It's been a very informative course. You enjoyed it. Charles, thanks ever so much for putting up with me for two days. Excellent. Well done. Very pleased with what you've done out on the water. I'm delighted to award you the Level 2 certificate Coastal endorsement for your course. Thank you very much. Please. Phil, thanks very much for your efforts over the last couple of days. You've done very, very well indeed. Thank and you. I'm pleased to be able to award you a level two certificate logbook Thank you. for future reference and for putting log hours in there and all the rest of it. Brilliant effort. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much. And that is a license to fish.